So tell me how you arrived at the digital cattle theory. Well, I mean, the concept I've actually been talking about, I, I talked about this idea back in the day called the digital gulag. A gulag is a re-education camp. A lot of people think it's like a concentration camp, but it's actually designed to re-educate people into communism. So the purpose, the primary purpose of the gulag isn't just a work camp, but is also to in, to, to bring people into an ideological belief. So that's very important. And I used to talk about how the gulag of the 20th, 21st century is not so likely to be like a hard labor camp somewhere, although they could add those in for the really bad people. It's actually digital conditioning. And so it's just taking that concept to the next level. And I did another, for example, podcast a couple of years ago called Data or the New Oil. And maybe it's Data is the New Oil. Maybe I did the, the grammar wrong on purpose, but I don't know. But at any rate, the idea is if they're going to pay you, and this is what I put in the thread, if they're going to pay you some universal basic income, obviously on a central bank digital currency, they're going to pay you. Why? Who pay? Nobody pays anybody for nothing. Mm -hmm. You have to be providing something back in return. And what it turns out to be, and this is just the model that's worked across like basically social media, social media is free. The saying is, if it's free, then you're the product. Well, what are you producing for them? And it turns out you're producing large amounts of data that they can turn around and sell. You're also, you know, creating advertising exposure and all of that. So fine. And they're selling you as a product to advertisers. There's this many people who are this interested in XYZ. So you want to advertise on our platform. So you're the product. But you are also a producer. They can mine you for data. I think Facebook did this magnificently back in the day where there was every other day. Was, I don't think Facebook itself was necessarily doing it, but companies were using Facebook. And it was like, you know, which pretty princess are you? Which kind of rock are you? What <laughs> what's your, what what tree are you? What springtime flower are you? And you take all these little personality inventories, miniature personality inventory tests, and you're like, I'm the pink Power Ranger. I'm, mm. you know, Brianna or whatever. And it's like all these different things. But what they were doing was they were gathering psychometric data off of you. In fact, highly granular psychometric data that's even more granular than like big five personality inventories if you take enough of these over the aggregate. And that's not even with it. Like that doesn't even count scraping your account for the things that you type or the things that you click on. Like click on by mistake one video one video on Instagram with some dude grilling chicken and your Instagram for three days is nothing but people grilling chicken. So you know that they're scraping the data of what you click on. Like you're like, it, it's, it's a problem. So they take that data and they do stuff with it. So there's this paper I read and I do want to give proper credit. A friend of mine came up with the term digital cattle. So it was his idea to start calling this phenomenon that, but I read this paper a couple of years ago. It's actually written by a left wing guy. It's not this like crazy conservative paper. It's an academic paper called Psychodata. It's by a author named Ben Williamson. So you can go look it up if you want yourselves. And Ben Williamson says that the purpose of gathering all of this data, and he's particularly talking about in schools using the social emotional learning program, but it would extrapolate. The purpose is to create, in his words, perfectly controllable political subjects and perfectly moldable economic participants or consumers. So the goal is to gather enough data off of you to know exactly how you'll behave under various circumstances. Yeah. Online find your various... activists and find your consumers. Basically. That's right. Exactly. And if you need to turn the activists up, you send stuff that triggers them and you have their psychometric data. So you know what kinds of algorithms could be personalized to their account that might do it. And if you need to turn it down, and I'm not saying that they have the technology to make this work yet, like AI is kind of stupid still, but it's coming. And if you need to turn it down so that people basically sit this one out and stay home, it's like the meme we joked about earlier, looking at our phone with the NPC, like, I don't know what I'm mad about yet. They didn't tell me. So they can decide <laughs> when to make you mad and when not to make you mad. But also they can decide like, oh, you're clicking on this kind of stuff. Or like my friend had her, her little like heart rate monitor app or whatever, and is tracking her health and her sleep and all this. And she sends me a message one day. She's like, ha ha ha, this is hilarious. It says the number two reason I lost sleep last year was masturbating. I'm like, did you ever tell your watch that you were playing with yourself? And she's like, no. And I'm like, it fucking oh, figured it out. Hi. 
God. What? And in principle, it could then correlate your buying habits over the next six hours after you do that. So then it starts putting like <laughs> stuff that triggers you to want to go to, I guess you can't go oh to Pornhub anymore. I guess God. that's out, but. Because like, they know your algorithm. Like, yeah, they know what you're buying. They know what ads they're showing. They know you. what you're buying, when you're buying it, what it's related. <laughs> to. Well, I should say, yeah. let me be very clear. In principle, they can know that. I don't know what they actually know. I don't know what their processing power is. I don't know what the data scraping capacity is yet. But in principle, especially if you're masturbating with the wrist that you have your eye, your Apple Watch on. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a pretty <laughs> distinct motion, I guess, but. Like, no, I hey, swear I was making a calorie thing. burned is a calorie burned. I'm so That's glad correct. I don't have one of those things. Jesus. Yeah, me either. But like th when you start thinking about that, like the, the goal of gathering the data is to be able to sell the data. And the point of selling the data is to sell it to marketers who want to basically create a perfectly tailored marketing program to you and your psychological triggers, and then to sell it to um, people who want to have exercise political control over you uh, in whatever veins. And then you start attaching that to like a CBDC and a, um, and a social credit system, and they can have a complete system of control, but also not just of control, because you don't just control cows. That's not the point of cattle. And here's the cattle part. You extract something from them. If they're dairy cows, you extract milk. If they're beef cattle, you extract, through a slightly more brutal process, you extract beef and, of course, leather and other things. So the fact of the matter is that you are being turned into a cow that produces data. That data is used to further condition your circumstances to keep you in your pen, keep you well-behaved, and more importantly, keep you producing more data. Because the data to keep people under control and to facilitate these high-control environments is extraordinarily valuable. One of the reasons the Soviet Union broke down, one of the reasons that communist China under Mao almost fell apart, although it got rescued, that's another story, is because they couldn't distribute goods and services at a uh, in, a, in a way that was satisfactory. So people were in misery and misery and instability eventually, even under tyranny, can create revolutionary circumstances that will try to break you free of that, where people will start to reject it. Well, if they can keep you, you will own nothing and you will be happy. If they can keep you in that state of fat, dumb and happy, like a cow that's taken care of, then they they can control you much longer and much better. But to keep you in that state, they need to know what they need to know in order to keep you in that state. So they have to extract lots of data from you. So you are providing the instrument of your own control in both the market and in political terms. And in exchange, they're giving you just enough to be able to make a kind of squiggly living. And then, of course, the whole thing will probably work like a Black Mirror video game where they're throwing you like sustainability credits. Hey, you're allowed to take three flights per year. I don't know how you're going to take three because normally you go somewhere and you come back and that's two and then you get this odd one. But hey, uh, you could sell your sustainability credits to rich people who then they play in the same system, but they don't really have any rules because you get to have like an extra outfit for your digital avatar for when you go on digital vacation with your little headset that you still had to pay for. You can have an extra outfit or whatever cool stuff on your digital swag that literally is not real and doesn't cost anything and you're happier. And then the rich people can go take your vacation for you and see the Mona Lisa without any of the riffraff in the way. Oh, my God. <sighs> right, so it's like the Matrix where uh... you, the people are the batteries, but you're not they're not providing body heat, which was always kind of a stupid premise because there's just not that much of it. And I always thought that was really dumb because like if you look at the, the reason they need the people is like because, oh, yeah, the sky is close. They can use solar power. And then like it shows a video of, like they pan up to the sky and it's constant lightning. You think that these things that could robots that are so intelligent, they could build the matrix and extract body heat out of human beings. They couldn't figure out how to extract energy out of lightning. Like, come the fuck on. That's fake. But anyway. The point is that they're not extracting body heat and energy out of you in this, in this matrix. They're extracting the data needed to control you and keep you uh, in the so-called happy state. Right. Keep you happy and keep you thinking these are all your own choices uh, because a rebellious exactly. populist is going to cost them resources. Um, yeah, it might cost them actually the ability to keep controlling the farm. Right. A rebellious populist in the United States busted up that aristocracy, for example. The rebellious populace in the Scottish Enlightenment broke some of that same aristocracy again. And so, the, yeah, these are the things that they want 
uh, they want control over. So, okay, like how far along are we in this process? Who who do you think are the main players? Uh, well, I mean, the this. main players are easier to figure out because, well, not all of them, but some of them because they give lots of money to it. We know that it's being coordinated through entities like the United Nations, World Economic Forum, and CCP that are working together. That's not in, in real question. We know that the WHO is trying to like inject a power grab through this. It's a subsidiary of the United Nations. We know that things like the Council for Foreign, Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission and so on are kind of behind this. So there's this network of elites some of whom throw gobs of money into this pot. Who throws gobs of money into this pot? Well, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation does, so they do. Um, the Pritzkers do, so that's one. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, they both do. Uh, there are other foundations as well. There's a list of funders into what's called Arabella Advisors. We know that the whatever's going on with the super big banks is somehow looped in. So Larry Fink at BlackRock is a face we can stick on that. And so you can start to get this idea of roughly who the maybe couple hundred, few hundred stakeholder experts will be who are really going to contour this, largely by who's giving it lots of money. Um, Soros is obviously fueling something, but Soros is actually kind of against what we're talking about. So he's a complicated player in all of this. Why is he against it? You think he'd be for it? No, his wet dream is called the open society. So when he looks over at China and he looks at what they're trying to build with some of this stuff, he sees that as actually a closed ended attach, uh, uh, approach and he doesn't want a closed ended approach. He thinks that that's what's caused most of the tyranny, whether it's from the Soviets or whether it's from the Nazis or whatever in the 20th century. So he wants this fiction that he calls an open society that I think is just a line for line transliteration of the critical theorist idea of a liberated society. Um, so he wants that. So when they start conditioning people to live in like kind of locked down 15 minute city, so on crap, he would see that as a, as, as a move into a technocratic world that is already decided what the world's supposed to look like. So he's not down with that. Um, but because he's ultimately aligned with the processes of, of say critical theory, and he has this vision of this utopia, uh, it turns out he's a fellow traveler to a lot of it. And a lot of people don't understand it. They say, well, George Soros hates America. And that's the what it's about. That's not quite the point. Um, George Soros wants to short sell America. He thinks America is an overvalued asset that he can make a ton of profit, both financially and politically by shorting. Um, but that requires getting lots of people inside of America to be unstable about America. And it requires getting a lot of people inside of America to hate America. So he funds initiatives in education to do that, and he funds initiatives in the critical theory, and he funds the border and the crime stuff, as we, as, as you see with the with the DAs and the, the the migrants. So what he he also does is disrupts what's going on in China. He does not freaking like China. China named him an international terrorist and literally called him a demon on Twitter last year from state media. And so they don't like George Soros because George Soros also doesn't like them. But in his book, Alchemy of Finance, he explains that he took his ideas in the 80s to the CCP in China and they loved his ideas because it allowed them to figure out how to transcend Marxism into the next stage of application. And so they're using Soros's ideas, but they're not using it in the direction Soros wants. And he has the same, the same misgivings at times about the World Economic Forum and United Nations and so on. But he still thinks that we've got to short sell the US, we've got to break up the US. So it's not that he hates the US, it's that he thinks he can short it uh, and make a lot of money off of it or yes, political yeah. power. Uh, this is a good question from K Max. Why did the super rich Larry Fink of BlackRock types fund this DEI woke stuff? Is it just a distraction from their massive wealth? I guess I always question the motive of the super rich funding this Marxism. Yeah, I think uh, right. It's it's control. It's no, they want to shift the balance of power to China <laughs> and out of the West. And so to do that, you have to destabilize the West and make the West completely dysfunctional. So they fund this in the United States because A, it allows them to control the corporations and to, by extension, the people. And B, because it doesn't work. Uh, it actually destabilizes the country. It prevents us to, from being able to be productive. How many corporations mm -hmm. have come out in the past couple months and said it's too expensive to do manufacturing in the United States because of all this wow. complicated DEI crap? And that's part of why. But at the same time, Larry Fink is heavily invested in China and in China's success. And so the goal literally is to demit. This is the kind of stuff that I got in trouble for for going on Rogan, but Rogan was tracking with me. The goal is to diminish United States and the West and 
hand the torch of global leadership, superpower status to China to facilitate the, the, the Belt and Road. Of course, I'm sure that they're invested in the things that will profit uh, in those directions when that happens. But the reason that he funds DEI is because it's A, a huge instrument of control, control and B, it just doesn't work. And they, I think they know it doesn't work. And by trying to force something that doesn't work, they break the system. The goal but isn't also, to make a functional U.S. They also know DEI is our weakness. So it's it's literally going to be our downfall. Yeah, well, they know that the people have literally like an elementary school level understanding of like civil rights type issues. They know that we're emotional about them. They know that we don't know how the law works, but then the law also has over the past 50 years has had a large number of loopholes worked into it, not just in practice, not just in, in judicial decision, uh, but also worked into the legislation. For instance, disparate impact analysis, which is the basis for all of the DEI analysis in law and all the frivolous lawsuits around Civil Rights Act got codified in the 1991 rewrite of civil rights law. And so it's it's kind of been woven in at all levels, this loophole for them to be able to hammer society with this obvious injustice that's per perpetrating itself in the name of justice. So yeah, it's a total weakness for us. Same thing's happening with this uh, asylum status coming across uh, the border, that it, there's a totally legitimate purpose to claiming asylum that's being completely exploited to the point where we can only consider this thing to be a loophole that's being exploited now. Um, if the asylum seeking process were able to be assessed and adjudicated in a timely manner so that literally 99% of the people showing up and claiming it are going to get shipped back under the, those circumstances in a timely manner, then yeah, that would be fine. But the fact of the matter is there's so many, they overwhelmed the system that it becomes a loophole because they come in, they say they're claiming asylum, they get given a court date six years later, and then for the next six years, they're just here and undocumented mm -hmm. and a, a complication, we'll say is the nicest way to put it, to the system that they are now... Um, halfway or quasi integrated into right and they're being told exactly like what uh what like well what dialogue to say they uh, are being coached to do this and somebody's paying for that and the people who are paying for that are people who want to damage the capacity of the united states or the other western nations to govern their own affairs that's depressing they so are, are we but are we, we at a point where we can't we cannot turn this ship around Nah, nah, I think we're already <laughs> turning it around. I'm more optimistic than most of the people. I'm like pretty, I am, to be fair, pretty close to the painting. But like I keep saying, I think that they're in a death spiral. I think they're going to do a lot of damage, but I actually think that what we're seeing is an awakening. People are much more curious about the American founding, the Constitution, the principles of the nation than I've ever seen them in my entire life. Um, the numbers of people showing up to things is still on a steady increase. The energy is still going up. Uh, so I think that we are actually, I personally, and I get in a lot of trouble for this, I actually am more afraid that we're going to overreact than that we are going to successfully uh, react to put a, an end to this. I don't think we're getting through, I like, I think some bad shit's still going to happen and it's going to wake people up. But I don't think it's going to be like when COVID hit, like, something bad happened and everybody was like, Oh no, it's probably real. You I don't mean, think like that's another, what... another event that can be taken advantage of. And Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> okay. And a lot of people are pretty pessimistic that we'll be able to, um, weather that and that things will be okay. I'm actually fairly optimistic that pretty much no matter what it is, we're going to blame them and the worse they make it, the matter at them we're going to get even if we have all kinds of crazy shit happening to have to deal with at the same time. So hopefully, all right, hopefully this doesn't happen on the eclipse, which is in like six days. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the it'd be great if, if they didn't do all this stupid occult stuff, but they do actually do a lot of stupid occult stuff. Yeah. The, the summon, we don't need to summon things. Okay. Like we're, we're, we got enough going on. I'm about to give birth, people. Uh... Yeah, this is like, I mean, it's like, this is like, we're already at Ghostbusters level. We don't need more.
Love you guys. Thank you for the chats. Thank you for the comments. I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Bye. All right. Love you guys. God, I don't even want to leave. This candle smells so good. I don't want to leave. All right. Love you guys. Talk to you soon. Bye. Love you all. Join the Discord. Feet. Love you all. Wow. You guys are awesome. Love you, Bye, guys. Bye. Now I'm really leaving. Love you. Bye.